But the ruins weren't dwellings or houses, so what were the ruins for? We know from cymatic patterns what shapes of sound look like, and I think it's very obvious by now what the ruins were for. For those of you that have not seen this yet, to remind you what sound manifests, how sound manifests physical form. Every sound frequency has its very own specific shape. What you're looking at here is just a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional effect. So this is actually happening in 3D, moving away, creating these beautiful shapes and patterns. Prime resonance frequency, that's what it's all about. Every frequency has a very specific shape or cymatic pattern. And as you can see, the higher the frequency, the more complex the shape. beautiful. So, what the stone circles are are just cymatic patterns representing the shape of the sound coming out of the ground at that specific place. That's it. So, what these ancients knew, or the Anunnaki knew at this stage, I believe the Anunnaki were the ones that built all these, is they knew how to, how to uh, identify the shape of the sound frequency coming out at that specific specific place, and they placed the rocks on the shape of the cymatic pattern of the sound, in which case they basically amplified those sound frequencies. So they created an amplification structure. So cymatic patterns, that's why each stone circle is completely unique. None are ever this, the same. And this is why we started measuring very powerful frequencies in the gigahertz, sound frequencies coming out of the walls, and electromagnetic fields coming out of the walls from 400 megahertz all the way up to 1800 megahertz at Adam's calendar. It is quite spectacular. Adam's calendar is a, is a mystery because the stone circles we can figure out and we can, we can understand how they amplify the sound frequencies because of the stones and the walls and the quartz. So it's the quartz in the rocks, in the stones, in the walls that do the vibration and the amplification. And, and the sound moves and the moving sound then creates magnetic fields and the moving magnetic fields create the electromagnetic fields. So, but Adam's calendar has got no walls. It, and yet it is infinitely more powerful than any of the stone circles. So something else is going on there. Some, there's another mechanism at work there. And uh, there we measured way beyond 375 gigahertz. The guy that was measuring it said he couldn't measure it any higher, but it, seems, it indicates that it goes a lot higher than that. And then 1,700 megahertz, uh, electromagnetic field running horizontally, and another one running vertically out of it. So we definitely have a, the indication of a toroidal field there a toroidal vortex field that's being generated at Adam's calendar itself. And we have these weird flower-shaped ruins, flower-shaped ruins that actually are magnetrons, giant magnetrons built out of quartz. And I asked two magnetron scientists, how much energy would a magnetron 40 or 50 meters in diameter generate built out of pure quartz? And the answer was, more than all the power plants on Earth today. So, whether that's accurate or not, I don't know. The point is we have thousands of these magnetron-type structures built out of quartz, all connected to each other into that giant grid, creating this huge energy grid of stone circles, magnetrons, generating insane amounts of energy, putting it, pulling it together, and doing something. And that's the question. What were they using all that energy for? It couldn't have just been gold mining. I guess some of it was used for gold mining, but I'm now starting to think that they were possibly manipulating the weather, geoengineering, creating a climate, creating oxygen, putting more oxygen into the atmosphere, something like that, because this is such a gigantic uh, uh, initiative, such a gigantic scale uh, infrastructure that they created. It had to be something to do, it had to, had to have something to do with much more than just mining gold. And... Uh, You'll see as we go into the magnetics and, and understanding magnetism and how these are connected to magnetic fields, 
how that could have also been used to possibly create oxygen out of sucking up water from the rivers because many of the channels from the stone circles actually run and they end up in the river. They just run and end in the river. And this has puzzled me for years and years. But now I'm starting to figure out different aspects of this in your mind. The more information you get, obviously, the more the, the different your conclusions are that you reach. So the stone circles are not the only ancient energy generating devices. It seems that to me that most ancient sites are actually energy generating devices. And we need to remind ourselves that they're made of stones. And especially the stone circles are made of stones that ring like bells. And, and these stones have high crystal content. And crystal content means quartz, quartzite, crystal, silica. This is all materials that conduct sound and conduct light. This is all the stuff that we use in the most advanced silicon-based technology today. And we also need to remind ourselves that digital data can be stored in crystals, in quartz crystals. But obviously that's not being used in the, in the technology uh, um, world today because otherwise they just give, it, give the game away. You know, once we can start storing digital data in our crystals, then the whole, you know, you don't have to go and buy that crap, the crappy storage devices anymore. Because you get one crystal and thank you for life. And it's virtually infinite amount of information in there. Um, so what we need to start doing is looking at stones as living, conscious entities, organisms. They store knowledge and information. They conduct sound and light. They have, they have essence and consciousness imbued in them. Rocks are not just inanimate objects. And this is why ancient cultures and these guys in the ancient times used stone in its original form. They didn't have to extract the active ingredient to put it into a crappy little flashy box to sell it to somebody because they didn't have money. They didn't do this as commercial entity or commercial enterprise. They were doing this to help themselves on a planet they were trying to make habitable for themselves. So they used rock in its original shape and for everything they needed to use it for. So all these ancient structures built from rock are just giant machines and using the quartz and the crystal and the silica inside the way that it should be used as resonators, energy generating devices, use, using light and sound to activate it. And this is why most of these seem to be aligned to the solstices, equinoxes, movement of the sun, and often movement of the stars. So when the sun comes up over there, and the first right, uh, the rays of this rising sun comes down a passage and hits a standing stone down the passage, the light and the sound of the frequency of that, of that light hits the standing stone. It's like hitting enter on a computer. It activates the machine to start doing whatever that machine was constructed to do. And then the sun moves, and on another solstice over there, it comes down a different passage, and, hits a, and the first morning light hits another standing stone, and that machine gets instructions to stop doing what it was doing and do something else. And possibly that's what happens with the movement of the stars as well, when they go down these weird shafts and etc. They activate the light and the sound frequencies of that light of the starlight and the sunlight and possibly the moonlight are the activators to switch on these ancient machines. So they built them without having to have human or intelligent intervention, just operated by the movement of the sun, the moon, or the stars. And we know that they're active because photographs like this tell us that they're still active. Obviously, we know this from the stone circles in South Africa. We've measured many of them. The sound frequencies are insane. Even Stonehenge, the, the beautiful um, uh, concentric uh, properties uh, 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 that have been measured in Stonehenge show us that it was an, that it's strong acoustic properties that were created by intent, not by accident. And I believe, just like everything else, Stonehenge was a very powerful energy-generating device, a huge, powerful resonator, and much, much older than we can imagine. I was there with Hugh yesterday, and just to confirm what I saw in 2010 when I was there for the first time, and my jaw nearly dropped when I saw the, the big, tall stone that fell over, the two tall st stones, one of them fell over and broke, and I was told over and over again, yes, that's, that stone fell and broke. And I pointed out to the people, look, if that stone fell over and broke and, and is only a few thousand years old, then that break should be a reasonably clean break, a sharp edge. Well, that's not the case. That break on that stone has erosion. That's about half a meter, about, you know, a foot this way and a foot that way. Erosion, I'm sorry, but sarsen stone, a dolerite stone of that hardness will not erode half a meter in a few thousand years. So... Either they lied to us about those stones and that stone did not fall and break, or if it is that stone that fell and broke, 
That Stonehenge is more than a million years old. It's just a very old, mysterious place. The geology is not going to lie to us. Our historians will. Our geologists will. Our archaeologists will lie to us. But the geology is not lying to us. The erosion is there. You can't wish it away. So think about Stonehenge in a very different light. Uh, next time you go there, check out the erosion on that stone. The ancient sites are just basically advanced technology on a gigantic scale. And we've never been, been able to see it because most of us don't really get um, uh, images or we don't see these ancient sites from the air like the stone circles. When you stand next to it and you walk in these temples in Egypt, it's so overwhelming and so mesmerizing that we don't really see the word for the trees. But when you start looking at it from the air, everything changes. And... Um, when I was there again in 2012, I realized that these obelisks are just like antenna. They ring like bells, like the stones in my museum I've been collecting. They're beautiful. They ring so perfectly. And when you look at these, these uh, temples in Egypt, they're just too many pillars, not enough space. It's obviously not meant to come and kiss butt of some king or some god and offer food and come there for forgiveness and all. You know. It's just, sorry, it's the wrong shape, the wrong size, too many pillars. Why? And when you start looking at it from the air, you realize what it's all about. It's not about worshiping and offering food and that. And you start seeing what's going on and resonating, vibrating pillars on beautiful platforms, acoustic chambers. And very quickly you realize that these are just templates, templates for gigantic circuit boards, gigantic energy circuit boards on a scale that we could not have imagined. And... Um, because they did this in times where money did not restrict what they were trying to achieve. They did what they had to do to either inhabit a planet or survive or create a result that they were looking for. Microprocessors become giant macroprocessors. And this is one of our favorite images. You can just imagine what historians are telling us about the kind of worshiping that used to go in these places here. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I know, those are major places of worship. Really? Yeah. And, um, and the pyramid is just a beautiful example of the same thing. It just carries on. And Angkor Wat, I mean, you know, there you got the combination of quartz and water, the two most abundant elements on earth, that both contain memory, conduct light and sound. Saksai Huaman is another great example of just a circuit board on top of a mountain. This is not a mountaintop fortress, clearly built for other reasons, that was possibly inhabited in more recent times and used by more recent civilizations, just like the stone circles, that some of the most recent civilizations used it. They created doors and entrances in, so they could use it for themselves and for their cows or whatever, but not the original architects. That's not what it was built for. Borobudur, Indonesia. I mean, this is just ridiculous. Literally, if you see photographs from right above, it looks like it's alive. It's actually, the photograph looks like it moves when you look at it. And then, obviously, on top of it, it's a dead giveaway. You know, these giant bells with these antenna going up into the sky. And it's always antenna going up into the sky. And it seems that it was human sound that actually held up this weird energy grid or that was used to activate these, these, these circuit boards, human sound, because you see the, 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 these perfectly acoustic amphitheaters that are always connected to many of these circuit boards. The, the Parthenon in Egypt is also an old circuit board. There's your giant um, uh, thing there, the resonating chamber there. And the rest of the circuit board has already been completely destroyed, and it's connected to the amphitheater here, and there's another smaller amphitheater there. And they always, the amphitheaters are always connected to the circuit board to activate it. You fill that with a bunch of people, you scare them, you get them excited, you make them make a noise, clap their hands, or sing, or fill them with fear, and that energy gets shoved into the circuit board. It activates the circuit board to whatever it's supposed to do, and, um, and we got a, some interesting stuff going on. Here's another example. There's your circuit board. Uh, connected with a beautiful row of ringing, ringing uh, pillars connected to the circuit board here, the amphitheater there. This is a very badly destroyed circuit board, as you can see. And there's another one, old remains of the circuit board up top, the top of the mountain. There's your amphitheater there that was connected to it. And uh, there's another one here in North Africa, in Algeria. Here they put the circuit board, I mean, they put the amphitheater right into the heart of the circuit board. It's really badly destroyed 
and, uh, and so it goes. And nothing has changed in 2018. Temples have just become churches, towers, steeples. Who came up with this idea of this, of this giant cone sticking up into the sky? Who was the architect that came up with this? Why do churches and places of worship have to have this architecture? You know, it's because people create sound and energy. You understand how important the sound and energy is and how these cones at the top of our churches and mosques actually send that sound and convert that sound into a different kind of sound as it sends it up into the sky. And so we start talking about the cone-shaped effects. Our sound is being harvested by cone-shaped roofs. And the business centers in our cities are nothing less than just giant things, resonators up into the sky, resonating the energy of the people and the noise and the phones and the anxiety and the fear. And uh, our city grids are just, just like giant circuit boards, all connected by channels of energy, just like the stone circles connected by ch channels of energy that never stop making a noise. We never stop making a noise. Have you ever been out into the country where it's really quiet and you get back into a city, how noisy the cities are? It's insane, actually. It's quite nauseating. And that's when I realized that in the Matrix, when Morpheus holds up the battery and he says, we are the energy. And when I first saw the Matrix, I had no idea what he was talking about. I now have a much better idea what Morpheus was saying. What we energy for at this stage is open to interpretation.